Welcome to Art Stars Explores, our province of play. My name is Kay Slater, and I'm the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts in Schools. Every month, we pick a new theme to explore together through art making and play. In these workshops, you can watch along any time you have time to make, or listen, or just watch. We encourage young people, families, and creative people of all ages to join us every week on Saturdays at 11 a.m. as we release a new episode. These videos are for you. Whether you want to join us on Saturday when they become available, or any time you want to make. We're so glad you're watching. Have you missed a week? Check out artstarts.com slash explores dash online or any of our videos on YouTube or Facebook to check out an episode you've missed. Okay, let's explore together. Before we begin making, Let's review the three rules of explorers. We've got rules in quotes here because they're less rules and more like guidelines or things that we like to have in mind before we start making together. First is respect. We practice respect for ourselves by checking in with ourselves every day before we start making. Maybe we didn't have a good night's sleep or we're feeling really good today. Whatever it is, we want to take the time to check in with ourselves. We also practice respect by doing the same thing for each other. And if we're not making alone, we're making with other grown-ups, or other youth, or friends, or classmates. We want to practice respect by asking them how they're feeling as well, so we can be mindful of each other while we make together. Another way we practice respect is with our tools. That can be about putting them away when we're all finished or using them safely. If somebody else is waiting for a turn to use a tool, we can use our words or our signs and share. We can respect each other by asking how long they'll need the tool so we can move on to something else, or if we need it now, we can let them know when we will be done and tell them we will pass them the tool when we're finished. We can also practice respect by acknowledging the land. So this space that you see here is my studio space. And I'm on the stolen or unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations as an uninvited guest on these lands. One of the ways I practice respect is by acknowledging where I'm coming from and to be respectful of the lands, waters, and to the indigenous people who are here and who have been here since time immemorial while I have access to these lands. You can practice respect by finding out the territories and lands where you are watching and making from today, and by being the best guest you can and respecting the host nations, the lands, and waterways where you live. The second rule is that nothing is for keeps. I encourage you whenever possible to take things from the recycling bin. You can take paper that's already been drawn on, or has writing on the back, or is ripped, and then you don't have to feel worried about ripping it up yourself, or crumpling it, or just trying something out. It doesn't have to be good or perfect the first time, because it's not for keeps. And when we're all finished, I encourage you to take it apart. That helps really make it so that it isn't for keeps. Because if you know you're gonna take it apart at the end, you don't have to make any finished thing. You can try all the things and ways of making. Our last rule is no expectations. If we're not expecting something to turn out good or even to turn out bad, we're open to it going in a whole bunch of different ways. And that means that all respectful and creative ideas are good regardless of what happens after we try something. If you already know how something is going to turn out, if you've done it before, we can be open to trying something completely new and practice surprise. And if it doesn't turn out, that's okay. It's not for keeps. These are the three rules that we like to keep in mind when we explore together every week. Okay, let's get making together.
Hello and welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater and I'm the Gallery Coordinator and Preparator at Art Starts in Schools. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of tracing. If you joined us last time, you know that tracing can be used to help you generate an idea. If you have a blank piece of paper and you know you want to draw, but you're not really sure what to draw, what you can do is you can take uh, another image that somebody else has drawn and you can trace it to get the start of a, of a picture that you can then develop or add to. We also explored this idea of copying and permission. And while we're in this space where we're exploring together, we know that everything we're making is not for keeps. And so because we're not going to be signing our names on the bottom of anything or keeping any of, things, any of the things that we're trying, we can totally um, take images um, from other people from other places that we don't have permission to copy because all we're doing is using it as the start of our draft or our play or our exploration. When we're all done making, we're going to put everything away or put it in the recycling bin and not keep it because we want to respect other people's drawings and work. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to flip that idea a little bit. And this time we know what we want to draw. We're just not sure how to draw it. And so with the world of the internet available to us, we know we can go online and we can find images that we can, uh, we can use as reference or as our source to learn how to draw certain things. And again, in this explore space, while we, um, we know we're not going to have any of these things for keeps, we can absolutely take things from the internet that we're not really sure where the source is or we're not really sure what our permission is because we're just learning how to draw those techniques. As soon as we're making something for keeps, however, then we need to practice respect by learning um, if the people who originally drew those images give us permission if the images are in something called the public domain, so they are not copyrighted, so uh, anybody can use them for these um, uh, for our exploration, or if there's an open source or a specific sharing license where if you use that image from the internet, you can use it, but you have to make sure you credit it or you tell people um, in your final drawing who whose work you used to create your drawing. It's all about respect. Um, and making sure that we're following the, uh, the requests of other people who have made and, and done the, the labor, the hard work to make their own drawings. So for this week, while we explore those kind of techniques, and if you want to follow along, do you have a window? A window is a great and easy way to create a light box because as soon as the sun is on, it becomes your light source behind your glass. And what you're able to do is put up you know, the picture that you wanna trace and another piece of paper on top of it and the light makes it easier for the image that you wanna trace to shine through. I'm gonna skip over light box right now and go to tracing paper because you probably more likely have a piece of tracing paper in your studio or wherever you're making today. Tracing paper is a um, more translucent or lighter piece of paper than uh, printer paper and most art paper. It's a little bit easier that when you put it on top of another image, it's easier to see the, the picture underneath. Um, examples of tracing paper would be things like onion skin paper or vellum, and you can get those at a, an art store. But if you don't have tracing paper or a window available, um, if you have a tablet, um, so like an iPad or a, uh, an Android tablet, sometimes what you can do is you can turn on the light and even have the reference image that you want to trace and put a piece of paper on top of that and then lightly trace it through um, with the, the image from the internet that you're drawing onto a piece of paper. What I have available in my studio is something called a light box and I'm going to get that set up really quickly. Okay, this is my light box. And so I'm going to turn the switch on on the side. And there you go. And so there's a light contained within this metal box that allows this surface to become like my window, uh, as if the sun was trapped inside, making it easier for whatever I want to trace 
uh, to come through the page. So if you have any of those options, that's great. One last thing that I didn't actually put down on my piece of paper here was, um, and I explored this a little bit last week, was if you and your recycling bin have some of these windowed uh, envelopes, we're gonna also try a technique where um, we use the plastic that is in these windows here to do some of our tracing. And so you can pull it off the envelope. I usually don't because I don't want it to, I don't want it to rip. Like I don't want the plastic to rip, but I'm just gonna try it out here. Yeah, it's already starting to rip over here. So I like to leave it in the, on the envelope, but now I've got one of each. Um, so if you have access to um, a windowed uh, envelope, I encourage you to try tracing with that today and I'll show you how. Now that's some more paper that I can use, which is great. And I'll put that over to the side. Continuing on that, while you're in the recycling bin looking for your envelopes, um, do you have some paper? Whatever paper you can find from the recycling bin is great. It could be lined, it could be ripped, it could be wrinkled. I've got some packing paper here. I've got some folded printing paper that I used in a project. Um, I've got the last pages of a note book that was ripped out. Um, it doesn't matter if there's already marks on it because nothing we are making today is for keeps. Do you have any mark making tools? That could be pencils, that could be crayons, that could be uh, pencil crayons, that could be markers. Anything that makes a mark on the page. And then last here is a picture. Do you have something you want to trace? Something that you uh, have always wanted to learn how to draw or to figure out how they made the drawing um, that you want to trace and explore with me today. If you don't, no problem. You can just follow along by watching me and then go look for a picture that you'd like to try after today's workshop. Okay, let's get started. I'm gonna start with my envelope because this is, this is a really um, cool way of tracing. Um, for things that are a little bit harder to get the light through. And so for this, for this activity, what I did was I have these blueberries that I wanna draw. I wanna learn how to draw blueberries. Um, but this package where my blueberries came from is very, very thick. And so when I turn on my light and I put a piece of paper on top of it, It's really hard to see, even with the light behind, even if I don't fold the bag, here, I'll put it over here. It's pretty hard to see all the details that I want to see here. However, if I use my clear envelope here, it's very easy to see because it's transparent. If you wanted to, you could tape it to the side. This is another reason why I really like it if you don't take it off the envelope because it sits nice, nice and flat. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of my markers here and I'm going to trace, I'm gonna actually trace these two, maybe these three, these three blueberries right here using my envelope. kind of slow because I really want to look at how, what makes this blueberry look like a blueberry. Next one, I'm going to color in where the dark shadows are. One. This one's kind of cool because it's got a dot right in the center. And then like the little, I guess the leaves, not really, I don't really know what it's called, but where the blueberry kind of curls up here. So each one of these blueberries that I choose to draw, or I chose to draw, very different. Cool. Okay, so I just drew the outlines, but I want to kind of, I also want to mark where the light of the blueberries started. And so you see the kind of shiny parts of the blueberry. I'm leaving those. I'm not making any marks where the light on 
the blueberry image is. There we go. Right, keep going here. It's kind of a light lightness right there. A little bit of a shiny spot right there. A little bit of a shiny spot there. The more I look at it, the more I can kind of see there are directions that the line should go as I follow and I color in these blueberries. Same thing, there's kind of a light over the top here, a little bit of light over here, and a little bit of light over there. All right. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to turn off my light. I'm going to move my envelope away from my blueberries. And there we go. Now what I want to do is I want to transfer these onto a piece of paper. Because this is now um, uh, uh, not opaque, right, because it's still transparent, if I was to now take a piece of paper and put this on top of my envelope, check it out. Now it's very easy to see. And so now by taking that extra step of using the envelope, I'm going to use a slightly thinner uh, marker this time. Yep. I can now transfer it onto my new page. And then I'll be able to color or add more things to the top of it. The other cool thing about doing it this way is that you can take a really uh, basic um, trace of whatever you're of whatever you're looking at, and then when you're all done tracing it onto your piece of paper, you can go back and you can look again at any of the marks that you might have missed when uh, when you uh, were tracing them onto onto the page. What are the different kind of mark making tools as well? I used a really thick marker when I did my original trace, but I'm using a thinner one now because I noticed it was kind of harder to get all the details when I, I used the thicker marker. So I could go back and I could trace it again, but I could trace it with like a, a thinner marker this time to see if I could get more details. What else do you notice? in your tracing. All right, turn it off. And there we go. So I traced the blueberries from here to here. Now I can go back and look and go, oh, you know what? I didn't really do a great job right here. Of capturing where where the opening of the blueberry was. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to add some of my own lines now on top of it. What do I notice? What did I not notice when I was so busy tracing it that I can see now? Now that I'm not really worried about uh, getting the basic shape down, what did I miss the first time um, I traced the blueberries? Depending on the paper that you use, sometimes you're going to be able to see things more than others. Sometimes your eyes get distracted by certain things when you're when you're tracing that you don't notice until you go back and you look. Kind of like this dark one over here. This blueberry was in front of the other one, so I'm going to make that line a little thicker. And then you can keep going. So using the envelopes, uh, the envelope windows are a really great way of when you can't get uh, enough light through the object that you want to print or so that you want to trace 
Um, so you do that transfer using that, that transfer paper. The same thing could be used if you did have tracing paper. If you had like the vellum or an onion skin, that would be similar. But the windows on your uh, envelopes, they're even more transparent. It's even easier to see images through than tracing paper and vellum. So why not use this free thing that somebody was already going to throw away as a tool in your tracing? All right, let's keep going. So I have, you know what, I'm going to start with the drawing that I had last week. A little bit smaller than I printed uh, the previous week. But what this is, is this is um, Alice from the book Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And um, Alice has just found the key um, on the table. She it hasn't shrunk down, but she's found this the little small door behind a curtain. She's about to open it to see Wonderland for the first time um, beyond the door. But what's really cool about this drawing, if we really look at it, is how the lines are used in this drawing to create shadows and create depth and to create dimension. And so we could just take another page and we could go, what are all the lines that we see in here? And that's a really great way of, of learning how to draw. It's like, okay, so there's kind of these, these um, vertical lines, or sort of these uh, diagonal lines over here. And it looks like some, some of the lines are going up and down over here. And so this is a really great way of learning uh, these different techniques. So this one in particular is called cross hatching. But I want to see how and when these cross hatching, hatching techniques were being used so that I can learn um, how to how to create that kind of depth so that it looks like that curtain is on top of a wall that's behind it. And what you can do is you can totally trace. So I'm going to take some lined paper this time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down my lights, I'm going to turn on my light box, and I'm going to explore some of the cross hatching. Okay, there we go. So much brighter now, much easier to see. And even though there are lines on my page, even if I was going to use actually this page that I've already drawn on, that's okay, because nothing is for keeps. I'm going to use this one, because why not? Just showing that it doesn't really matter if we've drawn on the page before, because we're not going to keep any of this exploration. So I'm going to start by drawing this line of the, of the curtain, maybe Alice's hand over here, maybe this part of the curtain here, and it curls off to the side. Okay, now I'm going to look at the cross hatching. Well, up here, the cross hatching looks like it's all going left to right. And they're kind of these smaller lines. They don't go very far across. Now, oh, they're going a little bit further across. Now they go all the way across to the other curtain that's on the other side. Interesting. Before we had also noticed that there were those diagonal lines. So the diagonal lines start like here, kind of like a, a scribble. They also don't go all the way across the page, but I had to look really close to notice that. Let me go to about there. Oh, there's a couple right there. The rest of the lines look like they're made up of just back and forth left to right lines. So I'm going to finish that. And then it looks like about starting here, they go from top to bottom. Some of them actually come down into the door over here. Okay, I'm going to draw the door. A little doorknob, keyhole. some of the curtain 
so that when I turn off the light, I can tell where the curtain started. All right. Oh, there were a couple of other lines that were down here, so I'm going to put those in as well. Okay. Let's turn the light back on and see what we notice. And there we go. Does it look like the door is behind these curtains? I think so. It also feels like the light was able to hit the door down here, but not so much up here. Oh, you know what? I think I missed some cross hatching up here. I think I did. Because I'm looking really close, I can see, well, why is it not the same? Why does it not look exactly the same as the drawing over there? There we go. That looks more like it. And this is a great way of learning those techniques. So you do your tracing, you turn the light on and go, why doesn't it look the same? I drew the same thing. What am I missing? And then all of a sudden you learn, oh, okay. So if what I want is I want to show that this curtain here, that this part where the curtain actually curled around over here, if I want to show that it is darker, oh, is my pen at a marker there? Uh, if I want to show that this curtain over here is, um, is darker, this section right here, then I need to draw really simple lines. And they can't be the same lines as the lines over here because then they disappear. Then they, they look like they're behind the curtain like the rest of them. But if I leave the crosshatch so the left and right lines, the horizontal lines, to only be behind the curtains, and I leave the, um, the vertical lines um, alone on just this piece of fabric, it makes it look like this is on top but still shadowed because the light is coming from this direction. So this part is shadowed, but not as shadowed as behind. And so by looking uh, really deeply and closely, we can start to learn how to crosshatch. So I next time I'm drawing something uh, for keeps, let's say uh, I wanted to draw a curtain, or I wanted to draw a dress, or I wanted to draw a cape, now, all of a sudden, when I'm drawing my cape, so there's my tie, and there's the top of the hood, and the hood comes down here, and then it comes up to the side. There we go. There's a clasp here, where it comes together. There we go, the cape over here. Now I can go, oh, well, if the cape curved, I know from when I drew that curtain in Alice in Wonderland that I have to go like this, right? And I'm not exactly copying this picture. I'm just copying the technique of now knowing that if the fabric came off to the side, what I should do is I should have my cross hatching inside here, pretty close together, the lines back and forth, but not have the lines back and forth on that fabric. And if I wanted the light right, to be coming from this direction. There we go. Keep going with my cross hatching all the way up. And then I can bring these lines down here. But what I'll do is I'll put these lines like this to show that this part of the fabric is more in shadow than this part of the fabric. And I learned that by tracing and copying the Alice in Wonderland drawing. And I could keep going and go, oh, I know that same thing. Even if there was a face in there, I would probably want to have the cross hatching like this to show that inside the hood there is deeper than out here. And even if there was some shadow here on the outside of the cloth, that it wouldn't be as deep wouldn't be as dark as inside the hood. And so this is what I'm talking about, about doing tracing to, to uh, learn the techniques. I have one more here, which is, um, which uh, was from uh, an old picture book when, um, when books were uh, done by letterpress. So when they would have to typeset, where they'd have to put all the metal 
pieces of lettering down um, or if they'd have to put blocks of wood um, with these things carved out and then put ink on top of it to press the paper on top they would use these kind of decorative styles on their on their books or on the pages to make the pages more attractive than just having lots and lots of words per page and so if you ever wanted to make your page more fancy or you wanted to have um, like a, a, a border around your page you can find lots and lots of these old public domain excuse me patterns online and it can be really frustrating if you wanted to start drawing a pattern I'm gonna start with this page right here um, actually no the lines are going to help you so I'm going to take I'll take this green one over here and let's say what you wanted to do was you wanted to do a um, a pattern of flowers right and you start drawing your flowers you have to draw a lot of them and all of a sudden oh no this one was too close this one looks kind of weird now and now i don't have enough room over here oh no those ones are really close together and so it can be really difficult just by using your eye to get really consistent um, patterns you could start your page by uh, measuring everything out or what you could do is you could take uh, a pattern that you find online that is already drawn out that is already measured that is already looking um, really even turn my light box back on there we go and check it out right so the flowers are already all lined up so i know that when i'm tracing this pattern that it's going to look really similar and i can kind of let my mind wander a little bit a little bit harder than when you're doing the, the freehand um, flowers over there because the the every time you don't concentrate the more um, your pattern becomes uh, uneven or imperfect if you're trying to go for a really perfect pattern uh, that's really frustrating you do all that work you fill up the whole page and then you get to the last line and your wrist is tired or your eyes are tired and then all of a sudden um, you have to redraw the whole page again if you're tracing, you're able to go, you're able to uh, let your mind relax a little bit. Don't have to do as much work measuring the page out at the beginning. You can just draw what you see through your tracing. There we go. Turn that off. And there we go. Got a really easy pattern. I can go in and I can color these now. It's a really easy way to fill up or make your page look more um, interesting or, or even just uh, attractive. If you've got a bunch of words or a bunch of uh, white space, you wanted to add a border, you could do that easily by finding a whole bunch of public domain pictures online. These are just a few ways to explore tracing. Um, and I'm gonna keep exploring next week with uh, our last workshop on tracing. You can check out this week and last week's workshop um, in our archives online, on our YouTube page, on our Facebook page, or on our website at artstarts.com slash explores online. Like I like to do, Every time I explore with you, I'm going to leave the camera running a little bit as I clean up my space so that we can get ready for next time and we respect our making space um, by making sure that uh, we leave it better than we found it. I look forward to tracing with you again next week. See you soon.